Hey, babe. Come for another chapter today? <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, um, I plan on, like, recording this until, like, the end of the book. And who knows? If people want, like, the other books as well, like, then boom. They'll come out. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, then I'll just leave it at the end of this book. But, uh, you, let me guess, want me to read you a story? <laughs> Alright. Go on, get all cuddled up and cozy. <laughs> What's the chapter this time? Well, it's chapter three. Also, I just realized that... Americans call it the Sorcerer's Stone, but the, like, people from, like, the UK and stuff, they call it the Philosopher's Stone. It's so stupid. <laughs> um, but you ready, babe? Okay. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Chapter 3. The Letters from No One. The escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor and Harry, his longest punishment ever. By the time he was allowed out of the cupboard again, the summer holidays had started in, Dudley was already broken. Dudley had already broken his new video camera, crashed his remote control airplane, and first time out of his race out on his racing bike, knocked on old Miss Fig as she crossed Privet Drive on her crutches. Harry was glad school's over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. Pierce, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were quite happy to join in Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. This was why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had been accepted to Uncle Vernon's old private school, Smeltings. Pierce Polkus was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the, pu the local public school. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuffed people's heads down the toilet the first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilet's never had anything as horrible as you, as your head down it. I might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. One day in July, Ampetunia took Dudley to London to buy his smeltings uniform, leaving Harry at Miss Figs. Miss Figs wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping on one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite fond of them as before. She let Harry watch television, gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for, his, for the family in his brand new uniform. Smelting's boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be a good training for later life. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her equal Dudleykins. <laughs> He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought of, he thought two of his ribs might already have cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen the next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? he asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did, if he dared to ask a question. Your new school uniform, she said. 
Harry looked in the bowl. Oh, he said. I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, I snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of old Dudley's old things for you. It'll look just like everyone else's when I finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall High. Like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses from the smell of Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual, and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere, on the table. They heard the click of the mail slop and flop of letters on the doormat. Get the mail, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the mail, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged his smelting stick and went to get the mail. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge, who was vacationing on the Isle of Wight. A brown envelope that looked like a bill and... A letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it. His heart tw English. <laughs> His heart twinging like a, like a gi- Oh, yep. <laughs> his heart twinging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library. And so he'd never even got rude notes for asking book for books back. Yet, here it was. A letter, addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, four privet drive. Little whining, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal, bearing a coat of arms. A lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing? Checking for letter bombs, he chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill and the postcard and sat down and slowly began to open the end. Yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing to you, Uncle said, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand, glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights. And it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the gray shred of old porridge. P -p -p Petunia, he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter and read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it cur curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh my goodness! Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously. As it's mine, get out, both of you, cried Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside his envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, Uncle, roared Uncle Vernon, as he took both Harry and Dudley both by the scuffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between the door and the floor. Vernon, Aunt Petunia was saying in a quivering voice, Look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching? Spying? Might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. What should we do, Vernon? Should we write back? Tell them we don't want 
Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No, we'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, yes, that's the best. We won't do a thing. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out the dangerous nonsense? That evening when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter? said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. Who's writing to me? No one. It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon non shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths, then forced his face into a smile, which looked quite painful. Er, yes, Harry, but this cupboard, your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why, said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take this stuff upstairs, now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms. One for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. One for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister Marge. One where Dudley slept and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit into his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to his room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old camera was lying on top of a small, working tank Dudley had once driven over the, to the next-door neighbor's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first-ever television set, which he'd put his foot through when his favorite program had been canceled. There was a large birdcage, which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real-life air rifle which was up on a shelf with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. They were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday he had given anything to be up here. Today, he'd rather be back at his cupboard with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd scream, whacked his father with a smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother, thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wished he'd opened that letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the mail arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go get it. They heard him banging things with a smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom, for Privet Drive. With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit by a lot of the smelting snake, Uncle Vernon strained up, gasping for breath, while Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard. I mean, your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley... Go. Just go. Harry walked around and around his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again. And this time, he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at 6 o'clock in the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He strolled downstairs without he strolled downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman at the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept along as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Arg! Harry leapt into the air. 
He strutted on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive. Let's click down upstairs into his horror into his horror, Harry realized that the big, squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in his sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour, then told him to go and make him a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the mail had arrived, right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the nail, mail slot. Oh my god, English. <laughs> See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails. If they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake. Aunt Petunia had just brought him. <laughs> On Friday, no less than 12 letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the mail slot, they had just been pushed under the door, slotted through the slides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs bathroom. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer, nails, and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so that no one could go out. He hummed, tip throw, tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped a, jumped at small noises. So he really sat there humming and just go, <laughs> I, I don't understand why the heck that would be the one song he chose to hum. Okay, anyways. Um, on Saturday, things began to get out of hand. 24 letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside of inside each of the two dozen eggs at that. Their very confused milkman had handed on Petunia through the living room window, while Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy, trying to find someone to complain to. Aunt Petunia, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food processor. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked, Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at his breakfast table, looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays. <sighs> Sorry, no post on Sundays, he reminded them cheerfully, as he spreaded marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply onto the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floors. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts out of his mustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous, with half his mustache missing, that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later... They had wretched in their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car speeding towards the highway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him around the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, VCR, and computer in his sports bag. They drove and they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turn and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry, he'd missed five television programs that he wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and a damp, musty sheets. Ew. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, 
sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate stale, excuse me, they ate stale cornflakes and cold tinned tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to the table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? Only I got about a uh, hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so that they could read the green ink address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cookworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly. Hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for. <laughs> None of them knew. He drove them into the middle of the forest, got out, and looked around. Shook his head, got back into the car, and halfway went again. The same thing happened in the middle of the plow field. Halfway across a suspension bridge and at the top of a multi-level parking garage. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia. Dully late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. <sighs> oh my gosh, this book's making me tired now. <laughs> it started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley sniveled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of the television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year... The Dursleys had given him a coke. Co uh, <laughs> the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't eleven every day. Uncle Vernon was back and he was smiling. He was also carrying along with him a thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone, out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing out what he lo what looked like a large rock away out seat. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. <sighs> One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to let it lend us his boat. A toothless old man was ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin at an old rowboat bobbing in the iron gray water below them. I've already got us some rations, said Uncle Vernon, so all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks with a chilly wind, what, 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 uh, and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed and the wind whistled through the gaps of the wooden walls and the fireplace was damp and empty. There was only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's ration turned out to be a bag of chips each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty chip bags just smoked and shriveled up could do with some of those letters now, eh, he said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching him, but, what, reaching them here in a storm to deliver mail. Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, he promised, uh, the promised storm blew up around him. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could not to curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were drowned out by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lightened dial of Dudley's watch 
which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd been eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dudley, if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped, he hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Perga Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was it the sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes to go. What was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling, crumbling into the sea? One minute to go and he'd be 11. 30 seconds? 20. 10. 9. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. 3. 2. 1. Boom! The whole shack shivered and Harry sat, bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. And that's the end of chapter 3. Oh crap, you're asleep. You look amazing while you sleep. Almost as great as you do when you're awake. I'll let you sleep now, my love. Good night, darling. Hi everyone, it's midnight and uh yeah, hi, I hope you enjoyed that me reading chapter three and in serious consideration if you do after i finish the first book if you would like for me to continue on the series i would gladly do so for you all um other than that i don't really have anything left to say um of course the playlist for anything and everything basically most of the time will be found in um you know the description as well as my Kofi, my Discord link, and anything else. Actually, my email's there as well. And, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else left to say. So I hope you all enjoy this chapter. And, yeah, good night, my loves. Mwah.